Well, when you were young, define young by whatever number you would like for today. Did your parents ever give you money to be able to put into the offering plate? Here are a couple nods. Ironically enough, I started a sermon after the offering with this. Why do parents do that? I ask that literally. To get you used to giving, okay. Are there thoughts or ideas? To include you, okay. Maybe to be able to teach them about giving. It was one thing that my mom did as I was growing up to be able to be the one who got to put my the envelope or the, the dollar bill or whatever into the plate. And today, God gives one of his children as Deanna had said, his child Hannah, a gift to put into the plate, if you will. As I read from 1 Samuel 1, this will actually be verses 9 through, 9, uh, 9 through 18. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look upon the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a male child, then I will send him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Hannah observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord. I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for using characters that we can relate to in all that they say and all that they feel. May we be able to connect with the characters so that your story written in the Word can be our story lived out in our lives. Amen. Well, welcome to the soap opera that is 1 Samuel. You get all the things a good old-fashioned melodrama needs. You got love, you got envy, you got conflict, you got passion. Everything you need for a good or not so good mid afternoon television show. Unfortunately, this week kind of, or this section of the scripture kind of drops us into the middle of the story. So we're going to rewind a little bit to last week's episode and kind of get caught up a little bit about what's going on in the first eight verses of 1 Samuel and the melodrama that it is. First thing, Elkanah, the husband of this story, has two wives. That sets up a whole lot of melodrama right there. <laughs> Hanina and Hannah, translated within the, uh, the Hebrew as Pearl and Grace, two very nice names. As you will see, the, language, the Hebrew language really has a lot of that uh, poeticness to it. So this was a time back in the Old Testament when polygamy happened, when a man could have two wives legally. 
not by God's design, but by God's allowing because of the hard hearts of the people. And Hannah, the one named Grace, that was Alkina's favorite between the two. His favorite wife. He liked her more than Panina. Unfortunately, she had one condition to her body, that she was barren. Or as the Lord said, Elkanah loved her, he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. One of the examples of that poetic way that the Hebrew translates, he, she was barren, she could not have children. Basically, in Old Testament times, she was worthless. Not my words, not my idea. Old Testament culture words and idea. I don't need that melodrama going on. <laughs> but having male, having children and having, if I can put it this way, male children specifically, was a sign of fulfillment back in that time. As Deanna had said, a, a person who was childless if they ever got into an argument with somebody about, well, anything, there was always that one zinger that somebody could throw. At least we have children. What about you? And there was no answer that they could offer. The other wife of this story, Panina, if you can imagine back to your childhood days, would be like the wicked stepsister type character. Unfortunately for Hannah, she was the very fertile, wicked stepsister character. The one who had multiple children, male and female. The one who rubbed it in Hannah's face every chance that she got. Her rival, Hanina, used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb, had closed Hannah's womb. As if the closed womb wasn't enough for Hannah to deal with all by herself. And hence concludes the recap of the melodrama of 1 Samuel up to this point so far. And the drama comes to an eruption as the three arrive at the temple at Shiloh. Think of the temple at Shiloh as Solomon's temple before Solomon's temple was built. It was the place to come and worship. And as they're getting ready to do their offerings and everything like that, Panina digs into Hannah just a little bit more. They happen to all be in the same place, and why not? And this time, it really ends up hitting Hannah. She can't eat. She weeps. She leaves the table without eating. And Alcana, her husband, tries to console her, but there's only one thing that's going to do it this time. Only one activity that's going to bring her any peace. Prayer. Well, as a woman of God, she certainly got that one right. When we are as stressed as under the gun as Hannah was, as under anxiety as Hannah was, that is the one place we can go, is prayer. She gets on her face before the Lord. You check out the descriptors that, she, that was used of her. She wept bitterly, was deeply troubled, had great anxiety, deeply distressed. These are the kind of things Hannah's, do, Hannah's going through as she gets on her face. Imagine what kind of prayer came out of her mouth when all of this was going on in her spirit. Would it have been our Father who art in heaven, that be Amen. Thank God we got prayer off the checklist. Done. I dare to think not. No. This probably would have been one of those prayers where the Holy Spirit had to intercede with those groans that are too deep for words to interpret those ah, 
that Hannah is probably living. A sheep, right, can't even come up with the words of how badly she wants a child. She says, after Eli had thought she was drunk, said, I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. That's quite an image. Eli, she's so moved, so in, in depth in this prayer. Eli thinks she's drunk. Her lips are moving, but her mouth is silent, her voice is silent. Fortunately, almost contrary to his character, Eli corrects himself after finding out she had been praying. says, okay, okay, you're not drunk, I'm sorry. Go with peace, may God grant your request. <coughs> What kind of prayer comes from such a distressed person? Praying so hard that the, chief, that the high priest seems to think she's drunk. One prayer. A prayer for a son. A prayer to be a mother. <clears throat> the interesting thing about this prayer is What's her motivation behind it? Why does she want a son so bad? Why does she want to have her womb open so bad that she is weeping bitterly, deeply distressed, on her face, praying so hard people think she's drunk? Well, given this love triangle of a melodrama that we're dropped into in this story, one could think of a few motivations. Is she, Hannah, interested in striking back at Penina, at the wicked stepsister character? Well, it's doubtful for a couple of reasons. Earlier in the chapter, the eight verses that sort of sets all of this up, we see how Penina had already had multiple children. Multiple sons, multiple da daughters. One for Hannah's side, one child for Hannah's side, isn't really going to change much. It's like, you know, uh, if you think of a sports score, eight to nothing becomes eight to one. Big deal. That's kind of what it would have been like had Hannah been able to have one child. From the earlier taunts, we can see God opening up Hannah's, per Hannah's womb isn't going to change Hannah's personality very much. If you've ever dealt with a bully, having a principal say something, not necessarily going to change the personality or the, the whatever it is that makes the bully the bully. And they're just going to find some other way to taunt at their target. The same way Penina is going to find some other way to be able to razz at Hannah. You also look at the preface to Hannah's prayer. What she lifts up. O oh, Lord of hosts, this is how she starts out her prayer. If only you will look at the misery of your servant and remember me. And not forget your servant, but will give to your servant. And the prayer continues. Those words in red, misery of your servant, remember me, not forget your servant, give to your servant. Do those seem like the words of a revenge seeker? I wouldn't think so, although being a human being, I would certainly understand if that was something she wanted, even knowing how futile it would be in changing the situation if she did get to have a child. So if she's not trying to get back at Penina, is she interested in her own retirement plan? Her own 401k for the Old Testament times. This one you may not, may need a little bit of background story to, to understand how I come up with this one. Think about it. Elkina, her husband, probably has some money. How do I know that? He's the one commoner in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. Four long books of Israel's history. He is the one commoner who is able to have two wives. 
That sets him apart. Probably took a little bit more money than the normal commoner had to be able to support two wives and the children that would come, even if they only come from one wife. If something happens to him, if something happens to Hannah's husband, where does the wealth go? Well, their system doesn't quite work like ours. It doesn't go to the women. It doesn't go to the widow, but to the oldest of the sons. Well, Hannah already has the sons. <clears throat> Hannah doesn't. Panana's sons, following in the personality of their mother, probably are already waiting for their inheritance. So without a son, Hannah would be not only a widow, but a childless widow. Which, just let me sum up, is a very bad situation for a woman in Old Testament times. With nobody to take care of you, and nobody to be able to inherit anything. So if not these two, why is she so fervent in her prayer for a son? If it's not about getting back at Panana, if it's not about looking out for herself, why? I will send him before you as a Nazarite all the, until the day of his death. Speaking of the son that she is praying for. Allow me to translate that into, well, not NRSD language. Give me a son so I can give him to you. That is what Hannah is praying. Give me a son. Bless me so I can give him back, blessing you. That's what has Hannah pouring out her soul to the, to the Lord. I will set him before you as a Nazarite. As a vow, vowing him to be set apart or to be consecrated for the Lord's service. Now this was one, uh, to kind of contextualize her words a little bit, you would be vowed as a Nazarite for a certain time period, maybe a month, maybe two, maybe a year. But Hannah says, I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. Putting before him the vow of having no products of the vine, wine, grapes, etc. He won't be around dead bodies, one of the other parts of the vow, and he won't have his hair cut. No razor will come to his head. And above all, as the word Nazareth says, he will be set apart, he will be consecrated for the Lord's service. Consecrated for life. Not as a bargain with God, not as a, please give me a son, and if so, I promise I will set him apart for you. Not trying to bargain, but expecting that God is going to answer. So they like say, give me a son, and when you do, this is what I will do with him. That's a key. She's not haggling God for a son, trying to twist his arm into meeting her needs, but praying out of faith that he's going to answer that very cry. And eventually, skipping into the verses just after what I read, Eli's promise of go in peace, may the Lord answer your, your prayer, comes true, and she does have a son, the son Samuel, who becomes one of the greatest prophets of the entire Old Testament. But that's another story. Give me a son so I can give him to you, Hannah prays. We often pray for a lot of things. Many different kinds of things come across the bulletin, come onto that green sheet of paper, come across the emails or the phone, both material and immaterial. I don't want to just pin this on being one or the other. But who do we pray like? 
when we lift up those prayers? Do we pray like Penina would? Lord, bless me so I can one-up the next guy. So I can have just that little bit more. So I can do what I want with it. Whatever that may look like for your prayer. Or do we pray like Hannah did? Lord, bless me so I can bless you. In the name of the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, bless us so we can bless you. May all the gifts and the blessings that you shower on us as individuals or as a community be seen in Hannah's light so that we can offer them back to you. Amen.